الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على نبينا محمد وعلى اله وصحبه اجمعين سبحانك لا علم لنا الا ما علمتنا انك انت العليم الحكيم اللهم لا سهل الا ما جعلته سهلا وانت تجعل الحزن اذا شئت سهلا رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي امري واحلل عقده من لساني يفقهوا قولي السلام عليكم ورحمه الله وبركاته brothers and sisters you watching ask him on live on iman channel i'm your host sham and i'll be with you inshallah for the next hour to take you through ask iman your your weekly uh, question and answer program it's an interactive program giving you the opportunity to ask any questions queries or concerns you have pertaining to islam inshallah ta'ala to the roster of sheikhs and scholars that we bring to our studio this week we have a very special guest who is always dear to us and very regular it's none other than sheikh abdul majid assalamu sheikh wa alaykum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh how's the week been thus far sheikh alhamdulillah no complaints mashallah anything interesting happened this week sheikh um, every time new things are happening definitely we are in a in the journey where we learn lots of things alhamdulillah alhamdulillah sheikh Uh, so brothers and sisters, brothers and sisters, so this is the opportunity to give you uh, the opportunity to ask any questions you have pertaining to Islam. So if you'd like to take part in today's show, all you need to do is call us on 0203-515-0757. That's 0203-515-0757. We are uh, streaming today, inshallah, on YouTube. So you can watch the live broadcast there. Uh, you can also ask your questions, inshallah. Alternatively, there is a WhatsApp number at the bottom of your screen below. So you can call us, you can message us, however you wish to do so. And inshallah, we'll get through as many questions as possible. And of course, we'll always give precedence and preference to the brothers and sisters who call in. So with that being said, uh, we'd like to uh, remind the brothers and sisters that this program is a general advice program. It's not going to give you specifics. Specific, uh, it's not going to give you a specific um, uh, scenario or answer to your question. It's more likely to be uh, general advice uh, regarding uh, general Islamic principles and with anything, of course, financial, medical, uh, and so on and so forth, we always ask you to consult your health members, uh, such as your health professionals, your doctors, your GPs, uh, <coughs> and so on. Uh, for any uh, intricate matters, or if you have anything personal that you wish to do, to, if you wish to share, then obviously you can always do that to your local imam or scholar. Um, inshallah, we'll help in whatever way we can. So, uh, without further ado, we'll hand over to Sheikh. Sheikh uh, would like to mention something about uh, the, the the medicine during the time of the Prophet and where we are now, within you know, in line with the fact that obviously we can't ignore. Uh, conventional medicine and we, we can't ignore our health officials and so on. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. In alhamdulillahi na ahmadu wa salli ala rasulihi wa umma ba'd. What Islam speaks about the medicine is not something that today we should only 100% rely on that. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has already said in the Quran, wa nunazilu min al-Qur'ani ma huwa shifa'un wa rahmatu lil mu'mineen. وَلَا يَزِيدُ الظَّالِمِينَ إِلَّا خَسَارًا So Allah SWT has revealed the Qur'an and in the Qur'an there are guidance with regards to the cure and healings related to the illness. So when we talk about that, we know today subhanAllah that uh, during the time of Rasul people had medical problems, health problems, people also had so many other issues in their life. And May Prophet Sassam did indicate to them about certain medicines. And those medicines, even today, the medical science have approved. Like one of the things that we know is honey. Honey is mentioned in the Quran that honey has got shifa. And honey is also used now in the modern medicine as well. Same thing with regards to the dates. Rasul Sassam has said that the house who do not, does not have the dates, that family is as good as hungry family, which means they're like a, a stingy and poor family who does not have the dates in their house. Another hadith of Rasulullah uh, that he told that if a person is affected with any stomach disease or affected with any sort of a poison or a spiritual problems, then he should take or she should take seven 
pieces of dates, which is special dates he mentioned, ajwa dates, which is in one of the hadiths it says that this uh, ajwa dates has come from Jannah and it has got the remedy and cure against the poison and against the poison that we can say like food, uh, food poisoning. And also uh, the spiritual way he has mentioned because during the time of Rasulullah some people used to practice witchcraft. So he said that this ajwa dates which is taken early morning, empty stomach, will, uh, you know, cure the person who is affected with the witchcraft. And another hadith of Rasulullah he said that uh, there is a shifa in uh, general hadith where he says that there is a shifa in uh, having dates. Another hadith of Rasulullah where he says that he used to open his fast by eating dates. So these are all benefits and today if you see modern science and if you search on any medical page on Google or online, you will find that the modern science have given eight different benefits of eating dates. Even medical pages, whether like, you know, the, any health pay website, they speak about it. Unless they have as a, somebody who is say, suffering from other part of uh, other sort of diseases and illness, then we always advise <coughs> on TV as well, as you have started your speech by saying that. So normally we always advise that don't just rely on what Quran says or what Hadith says, and then you say, okay, you don't take any other uh, advice or you don't consult your medical doctor. These are wrong things. If a person is suffering from severe illness in the body, then the first thing is call 111 or call your GP, call your surgery, and then take their advice. And they will prescribe you certain medicines, and those medicines will have this kind of things that Prophet has mentioned, alhamdulillah. And also we know from the ahadith the benefits of using uh, zamzam water. Prophet has said that zamzam water has got shifa. So as Muslims, we should believe in all these things, but at the same time, we should not ignore the medical treatment that is prescribed or which has been uh, founded today by modern science. We have to, again, consult the medical doctors because there are certain diseases which are very specific and that can only be, uh, you know, cured with the help of the medical doctors. And Quran also says that, first, alu ala dhikrin kuntum la ta'alamun, that ask the people of knowledge if you don't know. So we are talking about the medical doctors because it deals with the health. Mm. So we, Quran is telling us that consult the medical or expertise of the health when you have any health problem. I think it's clear. Yeah, inshallah. Okay, alhamdulillah. So, brothers and sisters, uh, we pray that uh, gives you some benefit and gives you some insight into what we can do or can expect regarding Islamic medicine, prophetic medicine, and of course, conventional medicine. Of course, like I said, like I said in the start, always consult your medical professionals before doing anything or before not doing anything, inshallah ta'ala. Without further ado, we would like to welcome our first caller for today's program. It's Brother Muhammad. Assalamu alaikum wa ta'ala, brother. Uh, what's your name? Uh, sorry, what's your, what's your question and where are you calling from? Uh, Assalamu alaikum, brother. Go ahead. What, where are you calling from, uh, Brother Mohammed? Uh, I'm, I'm calling from London. London, okay, sure. What's your question for us, Sheikh? Yes, Brother. My question is, um, is there any specific worship to do on the 12th of Rabi'ul Awwal? Is there anything special that we should do or we shouldn't do, right? No, we should do on the on. Okay. Should do. Okay, okay, 12th inshallah. of Rabi'ul Awwal. Okay, okay, inshallah. Do you have any other questions for us? No, that's it. Thank you. Okay, barakah feekum. Sheikh, the brother, you got Bismillah it. ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Uh, no, there's no any specific uh, indication or narration or suggestion given in the Quran or Hadith. Uh, it's only a historical event that is known out of 13 different narrations, <coughs> 13 different uh, dates of Prophet's birth. They say that the most common and very, like, you know, agreed or uh, narrated by authentic sources is the 12th Rabi'ul Awwal. So that's the only thing that Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was born on that day. So that's why it takes the significance in our Islamic calendar, in our Islamic month, and in our Islam generally. 
Otherwise, when we talk about the ibadah and worship, then Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has given us so many uh, indication that we should not specify one particular day out of seven days to do any specific act of worship. Like the Friday people have certain, some Islamic months, the last Friday of any month, like Rajab, they have special occasion, they do certain ibadah in the last Friday. And certain people, like in the last Friday or the last uh, day of Ramadan, or last Friday of Ramadan, they have like uh, Ramadan al wada uh, for uh, farewell of Ramadan. So they have those kind of things. Some people, they have got certain uh, specific uh, days. Uh, again, in Rajab, they, they, in our Asian countries, we have 22nd of Rajab, they have a sort of uh, preparation of sweet food. And, and they say that this was something introduced by Abu Hanifa Rahmatullah's teacher, uh, Jafar Sadiq Rahmatullah Ali. They say that he has said that the one who does not prepare food or sweet on this day, then on the day of judgment, I will, you know, uh, I will, he'll be answerable for that. Another narration which is, narrated by the people who celebrate this day, they say that any dua that you make, any prayers you have or any wishes you have, and when you prepare these sweets on second, uh, 22nd of uh, Rajab, uh, in Urdu they call Rajab Ke Kunde. So that is Rajab Ke Kunde means they make sweets and uh, kheer and other those kind of things. So they say that anybody who has got any wish to make or any, you know, uh, uh, du'as to make. And if he prepares this uh, food and serves and invites the people and serves to them, then when he makes this du'a to me, Jafar Sadiq Rahmatullah is saying that if he makes that du'a to me, then I will make it happen. And if it doesn't happen, then he can catch my neck on the Day of Judgment. So these things are uh, some, some ibadah they have like people, I know some of the people that I personally knew when I was in Dubai that they would only fast on 27th of Ramadan. The whole month they won't fast. They will fast only 27th of Ramadan. And then they will organize the hundreds of people to come and break the fast on that day. And they help them with iftari. They, they think that, okay, this is 27th is the greatest day in the month of Ramadan, so <coughs> they would do those kind of ibadah. Generally speaking, my brother Muhammad, there's no specific ibadah to be performed on 12th Rabi'ul Awwal. Definitely, it is very important day because Rasulullah was born on that day, and also it is a sad day because Rasulullah died on that day as well. So alhamdulillah, that two things we have to remember that he was born on that day and he died on that day. I think I've answered the question. Yeah, Barakah Sheikh. So, is, so what about people who make that into a celebration? They celebrate his birthday. Is that permissible? Are we allowed to do that? It is, see, celebration of the birthday of specifically of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu has to do with he himself. Like your birthday, who is going to celebrate you? Yeah. My birthday, I have to celebrate. Yes or no? Yeah. It is left to me whether I should celebrate or not and you. Or so when we talk about Prophet's birthday, we know that he lived in this world for 63 years of his life. Yes. 43, 40 years he lived as a normal person and 23 years he lived as a prophet and messenger of Allah. And everything that could lead by doing those things that could lead to the Jannah, he has taught us in 23 years. Mm. Everything, every action that could lead us to Jahannam, he has warned us against that in 23 years. Nothing has been kept secret. Nothing has been hidden from the Ummah. And part of even expressing your happiness, your joys and everything that you want to do, like <coughs> eat, to eat, we celebrate, we show our happiness, everything. So all the occasions where we should show our happiness, we are taught by Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So let's come to his life. 
63 years, there's not a single hadith which is confirming or any particular ayah in the Quran, which is 6,000 plus verses of the Quran, nowhere it indicates that Prophet Sallallahu celebrated his birthday before he became Prophet, and he ever celebrated his birthday after he became Prophet and lived for 23 years of his life. So based on all these things, we understand that. And also, let's see, Sahaba, they were those people, subhanAllah, they were willing to sacrifice their life to protect Prophet Sallallahu to express the happiness for him, to keep him happy all the time. Yeah. So it is not even narrated from Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman, and Ali, radiallahu anhum ajma'een. This great Sahaba, one of the, those Sahabas who are already, you know, given glad tidings to be in the Jannah, they did not, you know, even mention the birthday of Rasulullah or let alone celebration. Then we come to our four Imams. We say we are, mashallah, we follow four madhabs and we have four great imams, Abu Hanifa, Imam Malik, Imam, Ra, uh, Imam al-Shafi'i, Imam Ahmad bin Hanbal, rahimahumullah. All these four imams, they didn't celebrate the birthday of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So where did this come from? Yes, if you see the history, Imam uh, Qurtubi, rahmatullahi, he has mentioned in his book, Imam uh, Dhahabi, rahmatullahi, Imam Suti, rahmatullahi, and Imam uh, Ibn Taymiyyah, rahimahumullah, all of them, they have mentioned that this official celebration of Prophet's birthday came in the 6th century, 600 years after the death of mm. Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, not before that. Mm. It wasn't known in official way. And since then, subhanAllah, many things have happened. So I totally say that based on my academic research, that Prophet's birthday is not part of Islam. Okay. Celebration of Prophet's birthday is not part of Islam. Okay. Inshallah. Fikum, Sheikh. And <coughs> to celebrate it would be an innovation? Of course, yes. Okay. Fikum, Sheikh. We pray that answers your question, Brother Muhammad. Uh, for any other brothers and sisters who are willing to call and take part, you can do so by calling us on 0203 We're approaching the first break of today's program, which means that we'll be back with you in a few moments' time. Don't go anywhere. Take care. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.
الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد يا حي يا قيم وبرحمتك أستغيت فلا تكلني إلى نفسي طرف تعين وأصليه لشأني كله السلام عليكم ورحمة الله Welcome back brothers and sisters viewers at home and elsewhere You're watching Ask Iman live on Iman channel I am your host Hisham We are joined by our dear Sheikh Sheikh Abdul Majid who is with us, with us in here in studio in London Alhamdulillah and uh, he's here, alhamdulillah, ready to and ready and prepared to answer all your questions that you have. Pertaining to Islam, of course. And remember, my dear brothers and sisters, that if you want to take part in today's uh, show, all you need to do is call us on 0203 515 That's 0203-515-0757. Alternatively, you can call us on the WhatsApp number at the bottom of your screen below. Uh, if you don't feel comfortable to uh, ask your question or speak your matter that's concerning you, you can also message us, inshallah. You can remain anonymous, um, uh, inshallah, and we'll, of course, respect that and, and not share your name and, and where you're calling from, etc. Uh, and finally, uh, you can also watch us on uh, YouTube. You, the, the live broadcast is being uh, telecasted there. And, of course, you can ask your questions uh, in the comment section below. So... Uh, with that said, we'll uh, begin and resume, insha'Allah. Uh, Sheikh, the, we have a question, and the question is that when we're in salah, when we're uh, praying behind the imam, do we have to read the fatiha with the imam, or after the imam, or during the imam, or is that covered for us? Bismillah ar-Rahman rahim First of all, uh, it is a matter of disputes, because this mm -hmm. four madahib, they have, some of them, they go by this, that if you are behind the imam, so, Qiratul Imami, Qiratul Mu'minin, Mu'min, Muqtadin. So, those people who are Mamumin um, uh, or those people who are behind the Imam, uh, if the Imam has recited, that recitation is sufficient uh, for the people behind him. So, they make this, even then bring this uh, as an evidence, and they say that even in the Quran, Allah SWT has said that. وَإِذَا قُرِيَ الْقُرْآنُ فَاسْتَمِعُ لَهُ وَأَنْصُتُ لَعَلَّكُمْ تُرْحَمُونَ In Surah Al-A'raf, this ayah they said that Allah is saying when the Qur'an is being recited, then you should remain silent and listen to it silently so that Allah's mercy will come. So here they bring general verse of the Qur'an as to Surah Al-Fatiha as well. They say Surah Al-Fatiha is also Qur'an, so when Imam is reading, you should listen to it quietly and you should not... Uh, read behind the Imam, generally speaking. But if you see that uh, Imam Bukhari rahmatullahi has written a small booklet only on the subject, Qiraat Khalf al-Imam. And in that he has narrated nearly 200 Sahaba have mentioned that <coughs> the Salat without the Surah Al-Fatiha is incomplete. And there's a very authentic hadith which I believe that all the Muslims should follow that hadith because we are not following the opinions of this and that. We are not going into our ishtihad and our uh, judgmental uh, verdicts. We go by the sunnah. <coughs> and there's a hadith of Rasulullah which is in Sunan Abu Dawood and hadith is authentic. And the prayer that Prophet was praying was for Salatul Fajr. And he found that while he was reading aloud, somebody was behind him, also was reading. And that was d disturbing Prophet's Qirat. So Rasul ﷺ, after he has completed his namaz, his salah, he said, Hal hal khalfa are, you, are, are you reading mm -hmm. behind your imams? Then one of the sahabi said, Naam ya Rasulullah, yes we do. Then Prophet ﷺ has said, La taf'alu. Don't do that. And he said that, لا تقرأوا خلف إمامكم إلا بفاتحة الكتاب. This is another hadith, another version, that لا صلاة لمن لم يقرأ بها. And this is in Sahih al-Bukhari. Similar words are there. Sahih al-Bukhari, Sahih Muslim. And the, this confirms that even the Imam, when he is reading the louder prayer, and hadith, as I said, in Sunan Abu Dawood, and it is there, the topic called praying behind the Imam or reading behind the Imam. So this hadith is in Kitab al-Salah of Sunan Abu Dawood where Prophet ﷺ was leading the prayer and it was Fajr prayer. The Quran was recited louder and people were praying behind him. The Prophet heard somebody reading. So he stopped him and said, 
don't read anything after that except Surah Al-Fatiha because Surah Al-Fatiha, there is no rakat to be said completed or there is no complete rakat without Surah Al-Fatiha. So this is my opinion. If people, they want to take the opinion of their madhab or imams, it's alhamdulillah, their, you know, it's their choice. But alhamdulillah, according to my understanding, that Surah Al-Fatiha should be recited behind the imam in all five prayers. When it should be recited, that's a different way. But alhamdulillah, you have to recite Surah Al-Fatiha in all your Fajr, Zohar, Asr, Maghrib, Isha, behind the imam, even when you are, you know, uh, in any particular time, in any particular masjid, at any particular, you know, uh, sort of, prayer like louder or silent alhamdulillah so my answer is that one must read surah al-fatiha behind the imam in all five prayers because i believe that the salah is incomplete without it okay inshallah so sheikh what about a brother or sister who just became muslim they just reverted to islam and obviously they don't know the arabic language can they when they start when they start to perform the salah can they read for surah fatiha in english is that possible why they have to trouble themselves to read in English? They can just keep on learning till they learn it. And as long as they are learning and they couldn't do that and they have not learned, yet it's, their salah is accepted because they are, this, this is exceptional cases. Mm. This is like an exceptional case where the people are new in Islam. We know that, alhamdulillah, it's not that easy for somebody to... Uh, come and, and there are occasions, we know from the ahadith, that, that there were sahaba who came to Islam and they did find difficult, you know, difficulty to read the Quran. But Prophet Sassam did not say don't pray. Or he did not say, you know, you can pray your prayer in any, your, your language. No. He did say that he uh, guided this hadith in Sunan Abu Dawud as well. The Prophet explained to the sahabi what can be read till that person can able to read Surah Al-Fatiha. So there's no excuse for the Muslims, new Muslims or old Muslim, to you know say that I can't read Surah Al-Fatiha in Arabic so I can read it in English, I can read it in Urdu. No, it's not needed. Alhamdulillah, try your best and inshallah Allah knows your intention, Allah knows your efforts, Allah knows your you know, struggling and striving to learn the deen in Arabic, alhamdulillah, and preparing and perfecting your prayers. So Allah will accept it, inshallah. There is no, uh, you know, we can't say that you have to read. Uh, so there was another brother who was saying that, Sheikh, I don't know the tasbih. Can I take the, you know, paper in front of me? And when I'm in the ruku, I should say, look at that and pray. I said, why you people are troubling yourself so much? Islam is easy. Namaz is made for you to, alhamdulillah, worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in a very easy and calm way. Then, so try your best that at least minimum whatever things are required for the salah, learn them. But don't bring other issues because if you are relying on reading Surah Al-Fatiha in English, you will never learn Surah Al-Fatiha in Arabic ever. If you are relied, relying on paper to read when you are doing ruku and sajda and other du'as, then you will never learn anything in Islam. So I will say that no, don't read anything by looking at it like that just to prepare your namaz or to do things in the namaz. Learn it, inshallah, till you are learning and you have not yet done it, still pray, inshallah, Allah will accept it from you. Okay, inshallah, Sheikh. And for a brother or sister who's new to Islam, what, what would you advise them to learn first? Would it be the Quran? Would it be Arabic? Would it be the five pillars? What, what would they? I would advise them to learn about purification mm. after Aqidah. Like Aqidah, because new Muslims, when they mm. come, they don't know what is Tawheed and what is Shirk. So the Aqidah is very important because 13 years of Prophet's Dawah. See, imagine 23 years of Prophet's life as a Prophet. 13 years, one, three, 13 years he was in Mecca. And he was emphasizing more on Aqidah, La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah, oneness of Allah and worshipping of Allah. He was preaching uh, 13 years against the shirk. Shirk means that anything that was worshipped other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So then when Prophet came to Medina and from the 10th year of Islam, the, when namaz came first, 
Before that, it was only, you know, people were praying, but it was not emphasized as an obligatory prayer for them. So they were praying, but it was not like for prayers. But, uh, but what was important at that time? Tawheed. She, the, the, uh, she, they were taught, you know, this is shirk and this is tawheed. That was the only difference between the Muslim who used to, a person who used to come to Islam and becomes Muslim, and the uh, uh, mushrikeen of Makkah. So, and Prophet, when he came to Medina, again, after, in the second year, the zakat came. In the second year, the, hajj, the fasting came. And after a few more years later, the hajj came. But the most important thing is that the person should uh, make his aqidah correct, his belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what is Allah, and there are, you know, seven conditions to believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and then... What is, uh, how, what is the difference between Allah and the angels, six, ima, six pillars of Iman? Believing in Allah, believing in Islam, uh, angels, books, prophets, and Qadr, which is uh, the creed, uh, the destiny of Allah, uh, good and bad, and the day of judgment. These six pillars of Iman, <coughs> five pillars of Islam, in, when they come to this in Islam, they should first learn the purification. Because many of us today, we don't know what makes our body clean and what makes it unclean. So we have to learn the tahara, purification. And then we have to learn about what makes our wudu compulsory, what is, when it is compulsory, how it is performed, what nullifies the wudu, mm. and purification like the ahkam of the ghusl, the rulings and rituals of uh, taking bath. And... Uh, then after that, like women, when they have the menstrual cycle, they should know how to clean themselves in mm. that. So all those kind of things before, they, that's, these are the things they should learn. Then secondly, after that, they should learn salah because salah is the only difference between believers and non-believers. Uh, if a person is not praying, then if he has come to Islam, that means he has not actually come to Islam. He is uh, as good as he was before or she was before Islam. So salah, so all the rulings of salah, the first salah, conditions of the salah, what, ex what makes the salah acceptable, what nullifies the salah. So that way and gradually the person should increase his or her knowledge. <coughs> okay, inshallah. We have, uh, we had a caller, Sheikh. Uh, the brother would like to ask in, in, in relation to the previous question, Brother Ashraf. No problem. Asking regarding um, the salah. Let's say the imam is too fast in the fatiha and he's not able to catch up. Can he just say ameen at the end? when they're in jama'ah or does he need to does he basically if, if the imam is reciting fatah too fast does he ha, can he is it okay for him to just say amin at the end and he's but he's not reading surah al fatiha yeah because the imam is too fast doesn't matter he, he can be faster than imam at least he, he, I, I i will say that if imam is on you know express train you go faster than that but you should pray your uh, salah uh, surah al fatiha I mean, it's not something which is compulsory, but Surah Al Fatiha is compulsory. Mm. Okay, inshallah. Okay, inshallah. Uh, that's fine. And uh, finally, Shifu, we have 30 seconds. Am I sinful for missing the khutbah but making the salah? You are sinful if you are missing it deliberately. Mm. But if you have got any issues with your job or distance or traveling, then alhamdulillah, you are not sinful. All right, inshallah. Barakah uh, from Sheikh. We pray to answer your question, Brother Ashraf, and all the other brothers and sisters who ask the questions via message and via call. Uh, we are approaching the second break of today's program, which means, my dear brothers and sisters, that we'll be back with you in a few moments' time. But that doesn't mean you can, you don't have to stop calling, or you, that doesn't mean you can't call or you can't reach us. Or you can't message us with your questions. All you need to do is call us on 0203 515 Alternatively, you can message us on the, uh, the WhatsApp number below or you can call us on the WhatsApp number below as well. Don't go anywhere. We're we'll back with you in a few moments time. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah.
بسم الله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد Welcome uh, my dear brothers and sisters Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah to Ask Iman Lab on Iman channel uh, We are joined today by our dear Sheikh Sheikh Abdul Majid who has answered all of your questions as far Inshallah very excited to answer and speak to any other uh, callers and uh, brothers and sisters with their questions Inshallah So remember my dear brothers and sisters that this is a show giving you the opportunity to ask any questions you have pertained to Islam and you can call us with your questions on 0203515 You can also call the number at the bottom of your screen below which is a WhatsApp number and it's also very applicable uh, and convenient for the brothers and sisters who are watching us outside the UK uh, who are abroad and elsewhere inshallah uh, Failing that you can also message us your questions inshallah with your questions uh, but of course we'll always give precedence to the brothers and sisters who call in as we love to hear from you directly, inshallah ta'ala. Finally, we are being live streamed on YouTube today, which means that you can watch this show away from your television uh, on YouTube and you can also ask your questions. And let's say you happen to miss parts of the show or you have already missed parts of the show or you're just tuning in and you'd like to catch the replay, uh, you can also watch on YouTube, inshallah, after the show, uh, being in ta'ala. So without further ado, we'll continue the program and uh, we'd like to ask our sheikh, um, Faris is asking, Brother Faris, how can I benefit deceased family members? So, okay, people, people, Allah, Rahman, Rahim. Uh, Sheikh, uh, also, can we uh, highlight upon the fact that obviously people always say that, oh, this person passed away, this person passed away, but um, that's all they say. They don't really do anything for them, right? So, how, how can those people also benefit them? First of all, I say that the person who is alive, he should be worried about that. Mm. He should not be worried about what will happen when I die, what people will do for him. Because Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he told us that إِذَا مَاتَ insan in عَمَلَهُ إِلَّا مِنْ ثلاث. When a person dies, only three things will benefit him. And amongst those three things, means the dead person, only three things can benefit him. Number one, that sadaqatun jariya, that if he has spent something in the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which uh, that amount or whatever sadaqah he has made, which people are continuously benefiting from that. So all that reward which is generated from the people's benefit, uh, benefits, that will be put into his account as a reward. And the second thing he said that ilmun yantafi' bihin nas. And if a person has passed, they left this dunya, gone from here, but he left very, very important, you know, a source of material, material of education, ed education material, where people are continuously benefiting from that. They are learning and pre preaching and teaching other people. So he gets the equal reward uh, continuously. The third thing he said, the pious people, pious children. So pious children, this is where we can understand. If a person died and he has children, these children can continue the good things that their father or mother was doing. So then that will benefit the dead, dead person. So, but if a person who is like a, a nephew or niece or something uh, related but not directly children, they can also continuously do the same thing as that person was doing. But what we do is wrong. What we do is we have a celebration for three days. We ask people to come. And as I said, the last week I was in my family, uh, you know, gathering where they had uh, that of a lady. And people, they would come for three days. They sit in the masjid and they only chat about their dunya. They don't make dua to, for this woman who died, they don't even think of their own akhirah that today she has gone, tomorrow they will go. No seriousness. They are sitting in the masjid, talking, chatting, playing, or using mobile and calling mobile, checking the this and that, and then only waiting for the food. Only waiting for the food because it was announced that after some times, after Zohar, maybe after Asr, the food will be served. And this is how it happens. Three days, then, then 10 days, then 40 days, then... Uh, at the end of the year, the same day, the next year, the person died, they get together. All these things are not from Islam. This will not benefit the dead person, mm. and this will not even benefit the person who is still alive, and that is his, his, his or her person who has died. 
So this family will not get any benefit for that. The best thing is, alhamdulillah, follow the guidance of Rasulullah sallam and do something good. So Hisham, when you are alive, may Allah give you a long life. Uh -huh. I'm alive. Allah give us, you know, tawfiq to do for our akhirah by ourselves. If we rely on other people to do, I don't think so. Even the children, you can only expect them to fight for the, you know, wealth that you leave behind. They won't care whether you really died and they don't care. They even sometimes, as I said, that I know in this country, there was a father who was a rich man. He died and his children were also, you know, after the death of this person, the children were fighting uh, for the cost to be covered for the burial. So just imagine a rich person dying and his children are just fighting. Uh, they don't want to pay the money for the burial cost. So this is the life. So I, I say that uh, the intelligent person, now I, alhamdulillah, I want to do something in this life that will benefit me in the akhirah. I'm not relying on my wife. I'm not relying on my children. Mm. I'm not relying on my students. I'm not relying on my friends. I have to see that on the day when I'm going this, from this dunya, it will be me, myself, and my deeds. And I'll be facing the munkar and nakir. I'll be facing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So I should be worried about that, that my record, my account is clear in this dunya, that nobody could claim after that. And my record should be clear so that when I come to uh, in front of Allah, Iqra kitaba kafa bi nafsikal yawma alayka hasiba, read your book. Allah will say to us, read your book and you decide where is your destination, Jannah or Jahannam. So this is how I think myself and I say that this is the best way a person can help himself and the person can help the people where the death has taken place in the family. Inshallah. And what actions can we do on behalf of the Mayyid and what actions can we not do on behalf of them, Sheikh? First thing is that we have to see that the Mayyid has left any, the dead person has left any will. Mm. That has to be fulfilled. The death should be cleared and the burial cost should be taken out from the, whatever the thing has been, the asset, whatever the wealth has been left by this person. Then once everything, the debts, is, uh, debts are cleared and the will is fulfilled and the heirs has been uh, paid everything, then alhamdulillah, whatever the will is there, that has to be, you know, practically uh, uh, done, uh, you know, applied or should be acted accordingly. But that's the only way. The second, as I said, that whatever the good thing that that person was doing in his or her lifetime, we should continuously do that. And one more thing I want to highlight, and it is also, subhanAllah, I'm sorry to say that I'm on TV here, and this is my channel, and I have seen that the people also announce on TV that so-and-so died, and we are collecting money so that we can build well in Africa, in Pakistan, in Karachi, in the Dubai, in this and that area, because... We want the, the sadaqah to be, and the reward should be going to this person. This, where did they get this from? And I'm, I'm feeling, you know, sad about this, that this is how so many people died during the life of time, uh, life, life, during the life of Rasul Sallallahu during the time of Prophet Sallallahu when he was alive. So many people, they died. And Prophet never ever said, okay, he didn't come uh, announce in the masjid. He said, okay, Abdullah had died, and now I want to collect some money, so I want to build, you know, the well for him so that the people will, ben the Abdullah will get the reward for that. No. If Abdullah had died and Abdullah has got his wealth, then use that one third of his wealth to build the well and definitely he'll get the reward. If he has left nothing, then you can't help him like that by asking people. If you are interested to help him, pay from your pocket while you're asking people to do that. And this is not from the Sunnah, but people, they do. And I have seen people, knowledgeable people, they participate in this kind of things. This is not from the Sunnah at all. Would it not be charity, Sheikh, to, for people to fundraise and build Why? a masjid? Or build Did he a... say that? No, but for, <clears throat> masjid is different. Or like um, a, a well or... Like yeah, a... but for whom? Suppose if I die today, yeah. tomorrow Iman Channel will have a separate show. Sheikh Abdul Majid died. And we want to collect money for him because we want to make, you know, a well in Africa, in that area. where they, No, what will I get with that? I didn't say anything. I never had any intention to do that. 
So how can that, it's only just collecting the money from the people. If, if I, somebody is so honest and kind and, you know, caring for me, why can't he make it from himself and, you know, say, okay, this, uh, I'm doing it for Sheikh Abdul Majid and inshallah, the reward, I hope Allah will reward him. Do it. For, why are you asking people to do that? Yeah, okay. All right, inshallah. Sorry. <laughs> no worries, inshallah. No filters today, Sheikh. Um, uh, uh, um, I pray that answers uh, the question uh, and gives the answer, inshallah, for the brother or sister who asked it. Sheikh, uh, we had a sister call in and she wants a bit more clarification regarding uh, the Fatiha, reciting, not reciting with the Imam. Um, so Why if, sister? It was a sister who called in, Sheikh. Subhanallah, the, the sister, the, you should pray in your house. You don't have to be worried about Imam. Alhamdulillah. You, you will get more reward praying in the, in the house. But even if, even if you are praying behind the Imam in the masjid, you still pray Surah Al-Fatiha. And if you, know, if you know that your Imam is praying faster than you, then you pray before him. Before he reads Surah Al-Fatiha, read. Because Abdullah ibn Mubarak, Rahmatullah, it's not me. Uh, the, one of the greatest mufti and one of the greatest tabi'i from Maliki Madhab, he said that if the imam is reciting la faster than you, then you can read before imam uh, reads Surah Al-Fatiha. So you can, but still you have to read Surah Al-Fatiha. And I'm just saying this, and anybody who thinks that I'm saying from myself, then go and check the books of fiqh. Imam Ibn al-Mubarak, who was a Maliki scholar, great scholar of his time, great tabi'i, he said that, pray even, you know, before Imam. Read Surah Al-Fatiha even before Imam, if he has not prayed yet, and you know that he will pray faster. So you still have to pray before Imam if you want to. Uh, read Surah Al-Fatiha before Imam. Doesn't matter. So, Alhamdulillah, there's no choice, no exception. You have to read Surah Al-Fatiha with the Imam, before the Imam, after the Imam. Mm. You have to read. Okay, inshallah. Just to clarify, the sister was asking on behalf of her husband. Okay. So, <laughs> she had good intentions, my Lord. <laughs> I mean, uh, Sheikh, we're running out of time, but we'll get through as many as we can, inshallah. Uh, we have, uh, I believe, I don't know if it's a brother or sister, but uh, someone by the name of Ikna from YouTube, they're asking, the bank charges one pound administration slash transaction fee for every 1,000 pounds that can be exchanged or transferred. Would this be considered a riba? Uh, it's a fees. It's the a fee. fees is different than the riba. Okay, okay. So, alhamdulillah, it's halal. Service charges can be charged. Okay. And if you have agreed with the terms and conditions, it's not counted as interest. Okay, inshallah. And um, what about, Sheikh, uh, for someone who gets charged interest every time they put money into their account? What do they do with that money? What can they do? The, if the, they, have, they have the interest collected for, for, from their wealth, they have to take it out and use it for, you know, a social welfare. Okay. Any example, Sheikh? Like, for example, if somebody... Uh, had 10, 20,000 pounds left in the bank and they got 100 or 200 pounds as interest, they take that 200 pounds out of that and then they can build uh, taps on the uh, masjid, the yeah. toilets. They can, you know, uh, fix the problems that people, they can walk to the masjid and they have got problems with that. And if they, like, you know, the uh, places where uh, people who are doing some good things, any good thing, any ibadah, sort of ibadah that is not to be, you know, it's not comfortable for them. So that money can be used for that purpose. Okay. But not for you or not for me or not even non-Muslims. People, they say we can give the, you know, haram money to the non-Muslims. No. Tell even to the non-Muslim, tell don't do haram. And tomorrow he'll inshallah come to Islam. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, inshallah. Sheikh, we have about 20 seconds left. Any parting advice for the brothers and sisters? Yeah. Fear Allah wherever you are, because Allah's CCTV is open everywhere, every time. So Allah is watching you, that is recorded, and you will be answerable for that. Okay, inshallah. Baraka fikum, Sheikh. We pray that our the brothers and sisters today have benefited from today's show and uh, gained answers to the questions, inshallah. And hopefully you've left the show with a bit more knowledge, with a bit more understanding than when you came uh, to us watching the show to begin with. So we'd like to sadly round up and uh, say thank you and Baraka Jazakum Allah Khaira for all the brothers and sisters who took part in today's show. We'd like to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to reward uh, the Sheikh and his family and all those beloved to him for taking time out of his busy schedule, for the brothers being part of the program uh, and all the brothers and sisters who intended to ask the questions. We'll see you tomorrow at 8 p.m. Baraka Fikum. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah.
Ooh.